people gave to me and my family and my mom and other kids in my situation when they had nothing to gain in return. And that's character. You know, when, when you can give someone something, do something for somebody, and it's really not about you, it's really about helping them. Um, and you're not expecting anything in return. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is world famous WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. He is one of the most extraordinary examples that I have ever seen that your circumstances do not determine what you can become. On paper, he had everything going against him. He was born into extreme poverty when his mother was raped at the age of 11 and gave birth to him at 12. He was told that he would end up dead or in jail by the age of 16 and honestly in his early teens that seemed not only likely but probable. He was drawn to the streets, fiercely rebellious, wildly disrespectful, and completely out of control. Fortunately for him, his mother sent him to the sheriff's ranch, and there he began to turn his life around. He poured his passions and aggressions into football, and even though people told him he was too small and uncoordinated to ever play in college, he graduated as one of the most decorated football players in the country. With unending discipline and drive, he got so good that he had his pick of schools and was ultimately offered a football scholarship to the University of Florida, where he played under legendary coach Steve Spurrier. His tenure was so successful on and off the field that he graduated in three years and was inducted into the University of Florida Football Hall of Fame. He also went on to get his master's degree in higher education and play professional football in both the NFL and the Arena Football League before joining the WWE. His accomplishments in the spotlight, however, really do pale in comparison to what he's done off the field and out of the ring. In 2014, he was honored as the Humanitarian of the Year by the Rainbow Coalition. In 2015, he was named Celebrity Dad of the Year. And this year, the NHL team Tampa Bay Lightning named him the Community Hero. So please, help me in welcoming the man who is as comfortable on the TED stage inspiring people as he is in the ring finishing people off the driving force behind the Joy of Giving charity, which gives 10,000 deserving kids gifts and family services every year. Thaddeus Bullard, AKA WWE superstar, Titus O'Neil. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You are an absolute wall of humanity. I cannot imagine facing you in the ring. That would be pure insanity. Yeah, it can be pretty physical at times. I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. So talk to me about the, the outfits, man. They are absolutely dynamite. You and I were talking before we started rolling about what they mean to you. What, what is that all about? Well, I mean, just based on how I grew up, you know, I, uh, I couldn't afford nice clothes. So I got picked on a lot and bullied a lot about the clothes that I wore. And I always um, had the desire to like make a statement with fashion, but I just didn't have the money and stuff to do that. Uh, but as I got older, I realized, you know, people look at you differently when you dress a certain way. Uh, and your appearance means everything to some people right out of the gate. I just try to represent for the job that I want and not for the job that I have. I want to be able to, you know, be on talk shows like this and in platforms like this where I can be an inspiration and, and also draw people into just a different mindset of like what, what it is to be an African-American, what it is to be an African-American uh, athlete, a father, um, all these stereotypes that come along with, you know, my demographic of people. I kind of, from a very young age, I've always wanted to just dispel all those rumors, what an athlete acts like, what a, what a student athlete should or shouldn't be. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with me just taking pride in how I looked um, how I felt about myself and how I treated others. So walk me through, like, you're clearly deeply introspective. What was your internal life as a kid? Like when people are making fun of your clothes and you know, saying that your shoes are talking and stuff, like what is the internal story about you that's going on in your mind? Uh, I, I mean, my first result was to fight, you know? Somebody, and a lot of times it resulted in somebody talking about my mom and I just never, I just never have been one to talk about anybody's mom. You know, they 
as a younger age, you know, sometimes kids get caught up in, you know, uh, ragging on or however they, they term it nowadays. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say you're dating yourself yeah, with that one. Yeah, but uh, I didn't have a male role model at the house that can tell me, teach me how to fight or teach me how not to fight. Uh, my mom would just get upset just because she'd have to come out, you know, off her job, which she wasn't making much money at the time, waiting tables, come to the school uh, constantly uh, because I'd either fought or cuss somebody out or, um, uh, you know, just cause trouble. And I just felt like that was the only way that I was going to be able to, to keep these people from picking on me. But it never stopped them. I'd either get jumped or they'd just come back the next day and do the same thing. So. Uh, you mentioned her in the introduction, I went to a place called the Florida Shares Boys Ranch. And uh, it was there that I still got into fights early on, still cussing people out early on. How but old I, were you when you went? I was 12. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but there was a man there, Patrick Minogue, uh that just took a liking to me. Uh, he was like uh, the, one of the directors at the time. So when everybody else wanted to kick me off because they were like, this kid just ain't going to get it. Whoa. So even yeah. at the sheriff's ranch, yeah. you were like the most troublemaking. Well, I wouldn't say I was the most troublemaking, but I was definitely in the top five. <laughs> 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 I, uh, <laughs> uh, but I was also like one of the bigger kids. So it was a threat there, you know, and if, this kid, if this kid really got upset, uh, he could really hurt someone. And, uh, so then they end up moving me to the cottage with the older kids and nobody picked on me there and they kind of taught me how to be a teenager and it helped me grow up fast, you know, being around kids that were more mature. They still had their issues. Every kid that was there had issues, but they were, were a lot closer to understanding it's going to take hard work, discipline and, and learning how to work with other people in order to get to the next level. And for many of them, uh, just like myself, it was going to be a... They were going to be a first time, uh, a first generation college student. Uh, some of them would be, you know, first time graduating from high school. They come from a level of poverty or whatever. So it was a good move for me. It was a good, good, good learning lesson. But it also at that point, I think what Mr. Minogue did to me was when he told me I love you and I believe in you, you know, I never heard uh, anybody come to me and tell me that and he was a stranger to me and the day after he told me that um, our relationship just flourished he if I was getting ready to get in trouble or whatever I was the only person on campus that would be able to call him you know um, and he'd come out and play basketball with me he was a huge Chicago Bulls fan too because he was from Chicago so we had that tie in together uh, but he also told me something that was very critical in my way of thinking uh, he had asked me the question, you know, why do you think it is that you get into so much trouble? And I said, man, I don't know. I'm just a bad kid. You know, that's all I've ever done, you know. And, you know, up to that point, that's all I had been labeled was a bad kid. I was put in specific learning disability class, uh, SLD classes, uh, and I was never dumb. You know, I just never applied myself. And so uh, Mr. Minogue, you know, to me, was the epitome of just genuine love. It didn't matter what religion you were or color I was or what background I came from, he just saw something in me that made him say to me, I love you and I believe in you. And he didn't, wouldn't tell me why he told me that there's no such thing as a bad kid. He told me as I got older, I'll find that out. And I realized, yeah, there's no such thing as a bad kid. There are kids that are in bad situations around bad influences, making bad decisions. And you take those same kids, you put them in a good environment around good people. And they're nine times out of 10 have, you know, gonna have greater success. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the, the mindset shift because I want to frame what your story seems like from the outside. So um, I've worked in the inner cities a lot and I worked with a very aggressive young man um, in a one-on-one -on -one sort of big brother situation and I was too young and dumb to really understand how to help him. Mm -hmm. And so my only thing was I just want to show him beautiful things in the world because he never saw anything beautiful. Yeah. So I used to take him to see movies in Beverly Hills just because even though I was broke, it was like mm -hmm. movies cost the same, yeah. right? So I want him to see something beautiful. But I never felt like whatever was going on, like whatever story or belief system he had that was making him so angry, like it never changed. Mm -hmm. Something, and I told him I love you and all of that. Mm -hmm. So there was something that, 
is either unique to you or the way that you thought or Mr. Minogue and what he said, but what do you remember sort of what you were thinking at the time that began to change? Was it a, a thawing of your, your anger over your situation when he said he loved you? Or what, what was it? How could you replicate that with other kids? Well, I think every kid is, is different, you know? Um, and every situation is different. Your situation with the kid that you were with, uh, he might have heard people tell him they, that they love him a thousand times but then they turn around and proceed to call him dumb or stupid or whatever it may be. Um, and so to him, that's what love was and he didn't like it. So it takes a lot to try to mold that relationship. Just, you know, saying I love you is great, but, and going to the movies is great, but find out what his interests are. You know, um, I'm, I'm a big uh, pr supporter of public education and private education, but I'm not out here telling these kids, go to school, get a good job, go to college. College ain't for everybody. I know people that went to college with me that were superb students, and they still don't have a job today. Um, but there are some kids out there, a lot of kids out there that are very creative. So what we have to do is try to find a way to take what you're good at and, and, and find out what that other person is good at and find a way to make that work. Cause yeah, go ahead. Well, it's interesting because you've talked so much about the power of education and mm -hmm. I've seen so many interviews where you're like, look, I'll be all right. I've got my education. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I was doing something before I got into the WWE and I'll be doing something after. So <clears throat> how, like, what are you saying to your kids? I find that's a pretty good litmus test. Well, so we have uh, three rules in my home. Uh, the first rule is to love and respect everybody you come in contact with. You're not going to agree with them. Uh, you're not going to even like them on some occasions, but you love them and you respect them. Number two is to be your best. You know, um, if your best is a C on the test, even if it's D or F on the test, I w you know, you can never be disappointed if you know you gave it your all. And then, uh, you know, number three is we don't use the word can't. You know, it's not in our vocabulary. I was told my entire life, you'll never do this. You'll never do that. You can't do this. It's impossible for you to do that. When you tell somebody what they can't do, for some people that drives them, you know, because you're not going to tell me what I can or cannot do. Uh, but for other people, when you tell them, oh, you'll never be able to do that, like that, that could be the, the breaking straw, you know, and in, in that, in that back for that person, that's their spirit to actually go out and succeed. So I never tell my kids if they come to me and they may have the most outrageous idea, I say, all right, cool, let's figure out how we're going to do it. I never say, oh, man, you can't do that. We ain't doing that. Um, because I try to live by example by them seeing, you know, this, this whole thing with the joy given that you talked about earlier. I mean, we've done that for the last seven years. I think on average we give them between eight, 800 and 1,000 gifts per year. Whoa. So now, you know, I talk about like growing, you know, uh, and I said it last year, like I wanna, I wanna be able to have this event so big that we have to have it in Raymond James Stadium. And I want a football stadium to be the focal point because everybody knows where the stadium is. Mm. And then I want to do it on the outside of the stadium because I want people to drive by and say, oh, what the hell's going on over there? Mm. And then they actually pull in and find out. So I've gotten pretty much all the law enforcement agencies and churches and some secular organizations and, and the mayor and everybody else involved in this whole thought process. It's not just like the gift. The gift is just a carrot. It's like, number one, we, we can do stuff together, you know? Um, if, you're, if your agenda is to help make an impact on people's lives, then it shouldn't matter if your name's at the top of the banner. It shouldn't matter if, you know, your, your gifts have certain uh, name tags or whatever, whatever, however you want to do it. They won't be wrapped. We want these kids to see you're getting a good quality gift. We're not just going to hand them some stuff and say, oh, I, I give you a teddy bear at 12 years old. <laughs> and you're looking, I don't want this teddy bear. And then next thing you know, <laughs> somebody's saying, you know, well, the kid was ungrateful. Well, that's your impression. Right. So we want, you, you, you want, these kids are accustomed to saying, you're going to live in this government housing. You're going to go to this school. You're going to go, you're going to do, you, this is all you're good enough to have and this and that. And I want to be completely opposite, not only in the sense of what kind of gift they get, but then how it's presented to them with dignity. And then also, too, we all do these Thanksgiving 
you know, baskets and we feed the homeless and feed the needy. We do it around Christmas time. We do these big Christmas drives. But what happens to the other 364 days? Mm -hmm. You know, these kids are, that, that are coming out there in need, then their needs just not going to disappear because they got a toy or because they have food. So we, we have another aspect of this thing is well, I'm really excited about. It's called Engage 364, where we're taking agencies that do different support services um, throughout the year um, and inviting them to come out and present their services. And we'll have a guide so that people, when they leave there, oh, you know, I need life insurance, but I don't make enough money. Well, we got a company that's going to give free life insurance Whoa. policies. Yeah. Um, we have the United Way, who's been big, great partners with, with me and... You know, they, they have services that help people, you know, fill out uh, college ap applications and the tests and uh, grant forms, and they're going to do all that stuff for free. Uh, but they've been doing that stuff for free year round. Just some people just don't know because they don't have access to that information. Uh -huh. So we want to try to bring all these folks together with the hopes that we make these resources work together mm -hmm. to really make significant change, not just put a Band-Aid on this issue, you know. Buying school supplies is great, but what can we do to have it so that they don't have to buy as many school supplies every year? You know, get a sponsor to already have that in place. Or have an event where we can do a big backpack giveaway with, and serve thousands of kids. Mm. No, that makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to what you said about can't. So you don't say can't in your household. You were told can't a thousand times as a kid. And I love what you said, like that one can't could be the straw that broke the camel's back for that kid. And then really, truly, he believes it. Why didn't you ever break? Like, literally reading your story on paper, it's crazy, man. I don't know how you ever got out from under that story. So what was it about you that made that you were just impossible to break? Well, I'm super competitive. So uh, nobody's going to tell me what I can't do. And that's what you were thinking even as a kid? Even as a kid. Like, I might not have been good at it. I mean... Somebody, don't, you, I can't sing, but don't tell me I can't sing. Because <laughs> I'm going to give you my best singing possible. It's not that I can't sing, it's just I don't sing well. But you know what I'm saying? So it's like, for me, I always had a drive to, like, not prove people wrong, but to prove God right. You know, God said that he has great plans for me. And, and like, you know, I, my, my attachment to the homeless is that there was a homeless guy that used to come out to our high school football practices. And he asked, uh, you know, he used to ask, could he say, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, yeah, what's, what's going on? Because uh, I used to start giving him the stuff, you know, that we didn't use. I'd give him the muffins or the danishes or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever we had left over, I'd just give to him if he wanted it. And so, you know, he said, I just want to tell you that God's got a, a huge calling on your life to change a lot of people's lives. And if I wanted to be a jerk at the time, I would be like, well, why, why aren't, if you so, you know, in tune with God, why are you in this situation? <laughs> but I wasn't, I received it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was my first thought process of like, if this guy is saying this to me, he sees something in me. Mm -hmm. But I also want to find out how he got into this situation. And so I ended up asking him and he said, you know, if I told you that I used to be an executive uh, living in a, really nice house and beautiful wife and kids, would you believe me? And I said, well, if that's what you say, then that's, that's, what, that's what I got to believe. And he was like, uh, well, that was the case. But gambling, drugs, and alcohol took me away from my family. And um, you never really, like, understand people's pain and why they are in certain situations, even me with my pain and why I was feeling a certain way until you actually have a conversation and they're willing to open up and talk to you about it. And, you know, uh, probably a few months after meeting him, you know, I'd asked one of my teammates to, you know, kind of help him find work because they, they had a pretty, pretty good business there that was doing really well. They ended up giving him a job, giving him a place to stay. Um, and then, you know, next thing I know, maybe not two years later, he's running the whole southern region. And he goes from being a guy that's homeless to being a guy that has a job and a guy that I end up having a good relationship with through high school. And I kind of helped bring this kid, guy's family together at wow. 13 years old. So I'm like, well, maybe this is what he means, you know, connecting people. Mm. I'm a man of faith. I believe in God and Jesus. 
somebody else and their interpretation of what God and Jesus is may be completely opposite of mine. It may be Lutheran, Catholic, you know, Baptist, whatever. And they have different modes of religion and they do things in a religious way. Well, if they read the Bible, the same Bible that I do, Jesus walked amongst everyone and he died for everybody, whether you went to the church or didn't go to the church. Um, and then from a political standpoint, like it's like, there's crooked people on both sides, right? Democrat and Republican, not all of them are, just like not, not all police officers are bad police officers. But at what point are we gonna come together and make it about people? Uh, and not just people from the upper class or not just people from the lower class, but just people in general. Because if me, you, and your wife are all sitting in a hospital, my mom has cancer, your mom has cancer, your wife's mom has cancer. I guarantee you not one time would it come up, well, you know, uh, are you a Democrat or Republican? <laughs> you know, uh, what, what church do you go to? That, that ain't, that's the least thing that we worried about trying to have commonality between whether or not we have shared the same religion or political background. We care about, we're all here for the same purpose. Our moms are dealing with cancer. We want to do whatever we can to keep them on this earth. And that connects us, right? So we can actually find the genuine side of who we are, what we represent. And whether you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican or I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat, it doesn't matter because we learn each other as people. And it's okay to agree to disagree. And then this whole saying of like, can't we all get along? And it just gets thrown around all the time. No, we can't all get along. Uh, I can't get along with a person that is a bully. I can't get along with a person that's manipulative to people. I can't get along with, you know, racist folks. Um, just, I just never have and never will. But I can get along with those that have a like mind that want to make change in their own way. You've called yourself a bridge builder in the past, and you've got a pretty amazing story I'd love for you to share with us about when your grandmother was um, dying of cancer and you were visiting her in the hospital every day and there was a pretty hateful woman. Yeah. Tell us that story. Um, so my grandmother passed away from breast cancer in 1995. Um, I was going to the hospice, the woman that was her roommate, per se, um, was very, she was from the South, you know, and she was very racist. You know, every time I come in the room, she'd say, oh, well, there goes that boy. I had to do everything I could. She, you know, <laughs> I, I knew I had grown because I didn't respond the way I probably should have responded had she caught me a couple years earlier. Um, but, uh, um, you know, my grandmother, after a few weeks, my grandmother, you know, she reached over and pulled grabbed my arm and she was like, you know, if I if I if I have happen to die before she does, I want you to come back and see her. And I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just not my grandmother talking right now. Um, and so I, you know, it, it, it ended up happening like three weeks after my grandmother said that my grandmother passed away. And so my my, my grandmother <clears throat> saw something at the time that I didn't really understand why she was doing it, but I went back and I go into this room and the lady's like, like sits up on her seat and she's just starts bawling crying. And this is the racist lady? Yes. Um, and then she's like, I'm, I'm so glad I got a chance to see you again. I thought I'd never see you again. You know, I, I apologize for how I treated you. You know, I've gone to church. I've done so many things, you know, in church. I've served the homeless, et cetera, et cetera. But I, did, I wasn't doing the one thing that I know that God would have approved of the most, and that's loving his people. And then she, uh, she asked me if I can give her a hug. And uh, I said in my TED talk, you know, I was a little apprehensive about doing that because <laughs> she, she could have, you know, shanked me or something like that on the side. <laughs> But, uh, um, you know, I hugged her, and when I hugged her, she said, you're, you're like the son that I never had. And I'm going, okay. I never I didn't understand it at the time. I'm walking out, and then uh, the ladies say, you know, the ladies up front, they were like, that was so beautiful to witness because, you know, essentially the reason why she had so much anger towards you was because she kind of got dropped off 
which happens a lot in nursing homes or you know care centers. The family dropped her off, and she has two daughters, and the daughters just couldn't handle the uh, seeing their you know their mom in that position. And uh, my grandmother saw that before I would have ever saw it. She just saw, you know, an opportunity for even the the hardest of hearts uh, to be changed, even in their dying days. Um, when that guy told me, I love you, I believe in you, that changed what I thought of white people. That, that changed what I thought of people thought of me. Um, and I even did the exercise at the TED Talk where I said, you know, take, everybody take your phones out. Mm. And, you know, I want you to text anybody in your phone, and you can do it here too, and text them exactly what I tell you to text them. Say, I love you and I believe in you. Well, for some people that response was, uh, and I told them you're gonna get one of three responses. Number one is, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Did I do something wrong? You know, cause it's out, really out of nowhere, right? Um, and then the other one is, uh, you know, man, I really needed that. You know, I was having a tough day and uh, it's good to know, you know, it, was, it came at a good time. And then the third one, they gonna reciprocate what was said to them. They gonna say it to you. I know I love you and I believe in you too. So if you can have an impact on somebody that you know that way, then just imagine what's going to happen when you do that to a complete stranger. And it may not be I love you and I believe in you. It may be the action of showing, hey, you're worthy of nice clothes or a nice pair of shoes or you're worthy of, you're, you're worthy of being able to go and enjoy a movie. You know, uh, in college, the more successful people are the month, most of the time the people that are more well-rounded. In business, it's the same way. You know, investors, the more well-rounded their portfolio is, nine times out of 10, you know, I mean, you're rich, you know. Uh, so so uh, um, you kind of have an appreciation for what other people do and whatever the people are going through. Uh, but you can be inspired on any given moment, any given day, um, just talking to people. And when did you decide to start being honest about talking openly about what had happened? Uh, that, that in and yeah. of itself is such an act of courage. Yeah, uh, because I used to have this pretend that. Uh, really? Yeah, like there was a guy that like, you know, he was saying that he was my dad, and but he was really never around. Um, but you believed he was your dad? Uh, to a certain degree. I think we all have this like, the ability to like tell that something's wrong here. Mm. And uh, I call it discernment and uh, I kind of knew I wasn't his, his kid, but at the same token, like if he wants to step into that role, um, that's great. But the problem is him stepping into that role and just saying he's my dad is not enough. When you're not around, you're, you're telling me you're gonna do something one minute and next minute you're not, you know? That's one thing, and even with my kids, you know? Um, I always tell them like, just be 100% honest with me. The, the beauty in that is that every school I go to, every organization I go to, every parent that I talk to, they're like, man, we love your sons. They're the sweetest, most humblest kids. They, they work hard. They're, they're leaders, you know, all these things. And that to me as a father, like that's more, they, their character, is, and that's why, I mean, I wear this band, you know, Champions League with character. Mm. Um, and talk to me, define character, because the way you define it is amazing. Um, yeah, so to me, character is, is, is being able to, um, to be a champion for, for a cause based on not only your beliefs, but your experiences. Because like, we get taught certain things a certain way, right? Like most inner city kids get taught oh, well, you need to, you know, make good grades so you can go to school and do this and do that. But they never get taught, be on time, you know, show discipline, show respect, tolerance for others, this and that. But they never teach that, you know? And that's, that's, that's a character issue. Nobody's telling you how to be good to another person. They're teaching you how to do something from a book. And so for me, character is being able to, you know, authentically live out who you really are to the best of your abilities on a daily basis. Um, I also once heard you add to that, that character is how you treat somebody when yeah, you know they can't give you anything yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, my, yeah, my whole thing is like, people gave 
to me and my family and my mom and other kids in my situation when they had nothing to gain in return. And that's character. You know, when, when you can give someone something, do something for somebody, and it's really not about you, it's really about helping them. Um, and you're not expecting anything in return, right? Speaking of your kids, I know at one point they were playing on a football team, if I'm not mistaken, where they didn't keep score, they didn't tell yeah, you who was yeah, winning. Yeah, yeah. What, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, they were three and five. They were playing flag football. And, uh, um, you know, I just, like, came. I, it was one of, like, the few Saturdays that I was able to, like, like be there, be there. So I'm at the game, and I see TJ score a couple touchdowns, and then I see another kid score a couple touchdowns, and the other team, like, scored two or three times. But all this time that the scoring's going on, I'm not seeing like a scoreboard. I just see a clock, and they're playing time halves. So after the game, I was like, man, good job, bro. You did good. Your team did good. I'm dapping up all the teammates and telling the coach, thank you for taking time to coach my kids, et cetera. And then I was like, you know, what was the score uh, of the game? And TJ was like, uh, oh, dad, they don't keep score here. I say, well, this is going to be y'all last game. <laughs> <laughs> I need my kids to learn how to win and learn how to lose. And everything that they do in life is going to be measured by numbers. You know, if you go to college, it's based on your GPA and your test scores. If you want to get a job, it's based on numbers, you know, what, ex years of experience and et cetera, et cetera. What kind of degree you had, this and that. If you want to go and play sports and be successful at it, they're going to look at numbers first. They're going to say, oh, he averages... 31 points a game, you know, let's give this kid a look. Mm -hmm. Everything's based on numbers. And then the records, you know, they're not as important, but the numbers are definitely important. And I want my kids to learn how to lose and learn how to win. And if you don't even know, like, what the score is, you, and you don't know if you're winning, it's a close game, you try to keep it in your head and this and that. No, I look up at that scoreboard, and you see you're down by three with, you know, three minutes left, how are you going to respond? You know, how are your teammates going to respond? How are you going to get them to, to gather, gather around and rally together in the fourth quarter in that short period of time to come from three and end up hopefully winning by one or three or five or whatever? So, uh, yeah, I'm not with that, you know. Yeah, we're just trying to teach the kids to have a good time. That, that's, not, that's not how I was raised. Um, that's not how I think kids should be raised because they don't get taught how to lose, you know, they don't get taught how to win and win with character and win with dignity and integrity. Uh, Your life has spanned like this incredible range from where you started to the levels of success that you have now. What does it take to be the best? Number one is a work ethic. You got to be passionate about whatever it is that you're going to do, whether it be, um, you know, an artist. Uh, entertainer, sports figure, political, like whatever it is that you decide to do in life, you have to have an ex extreme work ethic. You got to be willing to do stuff that other people aren't willing to do. Um, you have to have respect. Um, the first thing I taught my kids at, when they can understand it was how to shake somebody's hand. Um, and, f you know, for me, for, as an African-American, there were times where you couldn't look certain people in the eyes, you know, and you had to look down when you talk, yes, sir, yes, sir, and this and that. And I'm like, look people in the eyes um, because it shows confidence. It shows that you respect yourself, you respect them, and it draws them into being interested. And then make sure that handshake's firm, you know. Uh, don't shake. And even kids now, uh, I, I meet kids 8, 9, 10 years old, and I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? And they give me the little two fingers, and I'm like, nah, bro. <laughs> I push them off right in front of their mom and dad. I say, we're going to try this again. And I tell them this whole thing about shaking someone's hand. And these are people that have been like sponsors and CEOs or whatever, that their kids learn something right there. Mm -hmm. And then they look at me and it's like, man, thank you for that. And the wife and the husband are like, thank you for that. Um, so for me, it's like, you have to set the precedence of like being authentic. You know, we live in a very, you know, inauthentic world where we don't do nearly as much as we could do um, if we didn't have a, an agenda. I don't have an agenda. You know, my only agenda is is to literally change everybody's life that I could possibly change in one way or another. Being authentic and being me has has literally changed my whole life. Um, because people are really starving for truth. 
What are, you, what are you teaching your kids about adversity? How do you want to see them handle it? Like obviously what you do is so physical. There's mm -hmm. such a pain threshold that you have to be willing to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've got some pretty deep lessons about that. Um, my kids, when it comes to adversity, they know since can't isn't an option, they have no choice but to fight through whatever it is they have issues with because can't is not an option. It's either I, I will or I won't. I can, I know I can, but I will or I won't, you know, and, um, and that's the thing. And in some cases, you may try your hardest and you just don't win or you don't pass the test or you don't succeed. That's part of life. All right, before I ask my last question, where can these guys find you online? Uh, they can find me at Titus O'Neill WWE, um, Facebook, which I don't have any friend uh, requests able to be pushed through, but you can follow me on Titus O'Neill. You can get through on that one. And then uh, under Thaddeus Bullard uh, is my real net Facebook page. All right, last question. What is the impact that you want to have on the world? Uh, the impact I want to have on the world, it, it, to me it's simple, but I know it's very hard to do. Uh, I want to get people to understand like the root causes and quit putting band-aids over the issues, uh, the root cause of the justice system being the way that it is. Let's try to really figure out how to make that different. The root cause of public education and the, the, the travesty really that it's saying. We, it bothers me that we're more willing to put money into prisons than we are willing to put money into educating people. and. Uh, health, mental health Ill, illness, which is a real thing to a lot of people, even those that have gone to college and been successful. Uh, I like to see our members that have served in the military a lot different and better. Um, and I like to try to have an impact of hopefully, you know, consolidating some of this homeless um, environment that we have in the country. Uh, and I, I know I can't do that myself. And my pastor used to say all the time, Pastor Poe used to say all the time, you know, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And so I just want to encourage everybody out there to do something. I love that. Yep. Thaddeus, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, this is definitely somebody that's going to blow your mind. To me, the, what he really shows is how far a human life can go and how much you do not need to be defined by your circumstances. It really up to you, is up to you to tell your own story to define for yourself what the things in your life have meant, how you meet adversity. It's absolutely astonishing to think how many times that he was told no and that if I gave you his life story on paper, you would say, for sure, this guy never goes anywhere. And the fact that he is just time after time after time proving people wrong from being told that he was too small and uncoordinated to play football and yet becomes one of the most decorated all-American high school players, goes on to play in college, gets into the College Hall of Fame, goes on to the NFL and Arena League. I mean, it's, it's absolute insanity. And even post-injury, continues to play football and then goes in to have an astonishing career in the WWE as a phenomenal entertainer, teaching himself how to do all of that, never taking no for an answer. And the thing that I find most fascinating about him is he's a bridge builder and somebody that doesn't sit there and wallow and dwell in the things that went wrong or the hardships that he's had in his life. He's only looking for ways to make other people's lives better. And I really hope you heard and understood the part about as a 13 year old, making a connection with a homeless man that ends up seeing him reunited with his whole family. It's absolutely incredible. There are so many tales like that as you dive into him. So follow him socially, watch him on the WWE, and look at the stuff that he's doing philanthropically. It will blow your mind. All right, guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're going to get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.